Thank you, Congressman Mark Pocan. And I want to extend um, my gratitude to Marie Newman um, for helping lead uh, this important discussion. Uh, and I want to thank all of the members who are here uh, who showed up in solidarity. Mr. Speaker, as someone who has experienced war firsthand, I have deep understanding of the suffering that comes along with it. As a child, I lived through a violent civil war that destroyed my home, ripped my family apart from each other, and killed many of my family and friends. I can still remember being just eight years old, hiding under the bed, hearing bombs go off outside my window, and wondering if we were going to be hit next. It is trauma I will never, I will live with for the rest of my life. So I understand on a deeply human level the pain and the anguish families are feeling in Palestine and Israel at the moment, and the helplessness people feel here in the United States who have family in the region, including many of my constituents. And it is for this reason that I abhor violence. Whether rocket, rocket attacks or airstrikes, violence does nothing to make people more secure. It only furthers the interest of the powerful while costing lives, futures, and families. But we must speak out truthfully and forcefully about the seed of this conflict and about what is happening today. The truth is that this is not a conflict between two states. This is not a civil war. It is a conflict where one country funded and supported by the United States government, continues an illegal military occupation over another group of people. This is not my description of it. This is the description of conservative Israeli leader, Ariel Sharon, who in 2003 said, and I quote, to hold 3.5 million Palestinians under occupation in my opinion, is a very bad thing for us and for them. It is an occupation, he said. You might not like this word, but it is really an occupation. To understand what is taking place at this moment, we must understand how it began. In 1948, 700,000 Palestinians were forcefully removed and uprooted from their homes in what has come to be known as the Nakba, or the catastrophe. 78% of their land was taken from them. Now consider that. 78% of their land was taken from them. Since then, 5.6 million Palestinians have been continually displaced from their homes in one of the largest and longest lasting refugee crises in human history. For decades, the United States, the United Nations, and many Israelis and Palestinians have pushed for a Palestinian state in which the Palestinians can enjoy the same rights afforded to their Israeli counterparts. But in the past several years, that hope has increasingly slipped away. The Israeli government and their far-right ethno-nationalist leader, Benjamin Netanyahu, has legally raised Palestinian ancestral homes, leveled entire neighborhoods, and violently suppressed any resistance. This is all to make way for illegal Israeli settlement outposts designed to displace Palestinians from their homes and prevent a future Palestinian state. Since 1993, when the first Oslo Peace Accord was signed, illegal set settlements have increased by nearly 400,000. And Netanyahu has made explicit his goal to annex much of the West Bank, home to over 3 million Palestinians. On top of that, Palestinian movement, speech, and economic activity 
are severely limited. Palestinians are not allowed to leave the Gaza Strip, except in extreme cases. Medical shortage are rampant, and youth unemployment was already 40% before the pandemic hit. People who protest, including young children, are routinely shot by the IDF soldiers, often killed with no consequence in Israeli courts. As a recent report by Human Rights Watch detailed, this can only be described as an apartheid, all of which brings us to the current crisis. This week, Israeli authorities were planning more forced displacement in Sheikh Jarrah, a Palestinian neighborhood in East Jerusalem, home to Palestinian refugees who had already been displaced. On Thursday, settlers began harassing and attacking Palestinians who were breaking their Ramadan fast doing a protest vigil in Sharjara. The deputy mayor of Jerusalem joined to mock Palestinians, saying to one protester, and I quote, did they take the bullet out of your ass? A petty, it didn't go here, pointing to his head. Of Ramadan, Israeli military forces stormed Islam, firing hospitalized. What happened next is well known. Hamas, lives of six Israelis. And the Israeli military launched airstrikes into Gaza, targeting civilian buildings which have already killed 69 people, including 16 children. Let me be clear. Every single death in this conflict is a tragedy. Every rocket and bomb that targets civilians is a war crime. I feel the pain of every child who's forced to hide under their beds because they fear for their life, and every parent who deals with that anguish. And I wish we as a nation treated that pain equally. But right now, we are not. And instead of condemning blatant crimes against humanity and human rights abuses, many members of Congress have instead fallen back on a blanketed statement defending Israel's airstrikes against civilians under the guise of self-defense, without even a mention of the children getting killed, much less what happened at Aqsa or in Shirjara. When the 15-member United Nations Security Council proposed a resolution this week calling on the Israeli government to cease settlement activities, demolition and eviction, and urging general restraint, the United States reportedly blocked it from happening. We are currently blocking the United Nations Security Council from calling on ceasefire. And to this day, we as members of Congress have not had yet a hearing or a briefing on this conflict or gotten, gotten answers on whether our weaponry or money is being used to commit human rights abuses. So I must ask, when we defend Israeli citizens' right to peace and security, how can we at the same time ignore the five million Palestinians living under occupation? When we say that Israel has the right to self-defense, how can we ignore the home demolitions, settlement violence, and force annexation of Palestinian land that is happening? And how can we say they themselves do not have the right to defend themselves? How can we pay lip service to a Palestinian state yet do absolutely nothing to make that state a reality while the Israel government we fund tries to make it impossible? I will end with this. Today is Eid, the final day of Ramadan, one of the joyous days in the Muslim calendar. And while I would rather be spending it with my family, I know there are families who are mourning the death of their children because of this. And I owe it to them to speak out on their behalf. So I am here today to stand for our common humanity, to say that every child deserves a life free of violence and oppression. Every child deserves advocates for their humanity, for their safety, 
and for their security. And it should not be controversial to say the same for Palestinian children. Eid Mubarak. Thank you, and I yield back. Gentleman has 26 minutes remaining. Okay, thank you. Um, I would like to yield four minutes uh, to my colleague from the state of Massachusetts, uh, Ms. Ayanna Presley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to recognize the deep trauma and loss of life perpetuated by systems of oppression here in the United States and globally. Many times I've stood at this dais and affirmed that our destinies are tied. That was clear when protesters took to the streets in the face of police murders, seeking to build a nation where black lives matter. That was clear when our democracy and our lives were put at risk by violent white supremacists who shattered glass and broke doors while wearing anti-Semitic phrases on their chests, carrying the Confederate flag, erecting a noose on the West Lawn. That was clear when students protesting to end poverty and oppression in the streets of Bogota were shot dead. That was clear when families kneeling during this holy month at the third holiest site in Islam were met with tear gas, rubber bullets, and hand grenades. Our destinies are tied. As a black woman in America, I am no stranger to police brutality and state-sanctioned violence. We have been criminalized for the very way we show up in the world. Last summer, when Black Lives Matter protesters took to the streets to demand justice, they were met with force. They face tear gas, rubber bullets, and a militarized police, just as our Palestinian brothers and sisters are facing in Jerusalem today. Palestinians are being told the same thing as black folks in America. There is no acceptable form of resistance. We are bearing witness to egregious human rights violations. The pain, trauma, and terror that Palestinians are facing is not just the result of this week's escalation, but the consequence of years of military occupation. In Sheikh Jarrah, the Israeli government is violently dispossessing yet another neighborhood of Palestinian families from homes they have lived in for decades. We cannot stand idly and complicitly by and allow the occupation and oppression of the Palestinian people to continue. We cannot remain silent when our government sends 3.8 billion of military aid to Israel that is used to demolish Palestinian homes, imprison Palestinian children, and displace Palestinian families. A budget is a reflection of our values I'm committed to ensuring that our government does not fund state violence in any form, anywhere. Many say the conditioning aid is not a phrase that I should utter here, but let me be clear. No matter the context, American government dollars always come with conditions. The question at hand is should our taxpayer dollars create conditions for justice, healing, and repair? Or should those dollars create conditions for oppression and apartheid? Now, while I hold space, do space for the storied history and unique lived experiences on the ground globally, there is a through line here. And whether we are talking about the militarization of our communities or weapons of war, the question is the same. If our budgets are a statement of our values, what do we value? Whose lives do we value? We have seen footage of Israeli and Palestinian children huddled fearfully while rockets blanket their homeland. No child should live in fear. No child should grow up in the midst of a conflict that robs them of a childhood. And Palestinian children do not have the same protections afforded to them. Without the U.S. exerting pressure on Israel to de-escalate, the explosive situation in Jerusalem is igniting further violence, not just in the city, but beyond. It is clear there is a grave asymmetry of power here. Palestinians do not have a sovereign state and the protections that come with it. Following forceful violence against the Palestinians simply seeking to remain in their family homes, militant groups in Gaza have launched rockets at Israeli cities, resulting in seven deaths, including a child. In response, the Israeli military has launched severe attacks on Gaza, killing 83 people, 17 of whom are children. This is devastating. The destinies of the Israeli and Palestinian people are tied our outrage at the pain, violence, and oppression they face must be clear and unapologetic. Equal outrage for violence perpetrated against all people. And moral clarity when state-sanctioned violence is claiming the lives of innocent mothers, fathers, daughters, and sons. From Jerusalem to Boston, from Randolph to Gaza, from Colombia to Yemen, our destinies are tied and everyone deserves to live free from fear 
and to no peace. Thank you, and I yield to the gentleman from Wisconsin. Thank you very much for those remarks. Uh, I'm going to ask. I think this has been a very difficult week for us as a global community, as communities that are concerned for human rights, uh, all human rights and in, in general and in particular, um, the rights of Palestinians and Israelis alike that have been impacted by the fear and violence of this week. Now, what I think is, you know, it's important is that um, I'll start with a story. You know, as a little girl, um, my family comes from the island of Puerto Rico. And I grew up uh, visiting my family on the island of Vieques and communities on the island of, of Vieques, where the United States bombed its own territories, its own communities. And I would go to sleep as a little girl to the sound of US bombs detonating. Practice is what it was called at the time, practice. And when I saw those airstrikes that are supported with US funds, I could not help but wonder if our communities were practice for this. This is our business because we are playing a role in it. And the United States must acknowledge its role in the injustice and human rights violations of Palestinians. This is not about both sides. This is about an imbalance of power. When I first got here in 2019, the Israeli government refused to admit two members of the United States Congress, Rashida Tlaib and Representative Ilhan Omar, into the country. Banned members of this very body because of who they were said it was a sign of weakness. We have to have the courage to name our contributions. And sometimes I can't help but wonder if the reason we don't do that, if we're scared to stand up to the incarceration of children in Palestine, is because maybe it'll force us to, to confront the incarceration of children here on our border. If by standing up to the injustices there, it will prompt us to stand up to the injustices here. We have a responsibility. And if we have historically said and committed to a role as an honest broker, then we must fulfill that role. That means we have to be honest with ourselves, with, with what our aid supports. We have to be honest and ask ourselves questions like why we are using our veto power and the UN Security Council in, in preventing statements from being released about concerns for this violence alike. The President and many other figures this week stated that Israel has a right to self-defense and this is uh, a sentiment that is echoed across this body. But do Palestinians have a right to survive? Do we believe that? And if so, we have a responsibility to that as well. And with that, I yield back to the representative. Thank you very much. Congress, you. Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib. Thank you so much, Mark. I'm actually, I believe, the second. Um, but I am the only Palestinian American member of Congress now and my mere existence has disrupted the status quo. I am a so personal for me. I am a reminder to colleagues that Palestinians do indeed exist, that we are human, that we are allowed to dream. We are mothers, daughters, granddaughters. We are justice seekers and are unapologetically about our fight against oppressions of all forms. And colleagues, 
Palestinians aren't going anywhere no matter how much money you send to Israel's apartheid government. If we are, good to, are to make good on our promises to support equal human rights for all, it is our duty to end the apartheid system that for decades has subjected Palestinians to inhumane treatment and racism. Reducing Palestinians to live in utter fear and terror of losing a child, being indefinitely detained or killed because of who they are, and the unequal rights and protections they have under Israeli law. It must end. One of Israel's most prominent human rights organizations, Beth Salem, has declared Israel an apartheid state. Human Rights Watch recently recognized it too. This is what Palestinians living under Israel's oppression have been telling us for decades. I have been told by some of my colleagues who dispute the truth about segregation, racism, and violence in Israel towards Palestinians that I, that I need to know the history. What they mean, unintentionally or not, is that Palestinians do not have the right to tell the truth about what happened to them during the founding of Israel. They are in effect, in fact, they erase the truth about ethnic cleansing of Palestinians in Israel that some refer to as the Nakba, our catastrophe. As Palestinians talk about our history, know that many of my black neighbors, indigenous communities, may not know what we mean by Nakba, but they do understand what it means to be killed, expelled from your home, land, made homeless, and stripped of your human rights. My ancestors and current family in Palestine deserve the world to hear their history without obstruction. They have a right to be able to explain to the world that they are still suffering, still being dispossessed, still being killed as the world watches and does nothing. As Peter Beinart, an American of Jewish faith, writes, quote, when you tell a people to forget its past, you are not proposing peace. You are proposing extinction. The Palestinian story is that of being made a refugee on the lands you called home. We cannot have an honest conversation about U.S. military support for the Israeli government today without acknowledging that for Palestinians, the catastrophe of displacement and dehumanization in their homeland has been ongoing since 1948. To read the statements from President Biden, Secretary Blinken, General Austin, and leaders of both parties, you'd hardly know Palestinians existed at all. There has been no recognition of the attack on Palestinian families being ripped from their homes in East Jerusalem right now, or home demolitions. No mention of children being detained or murdered. No recognition of a sustained campaign of harassment and terror by Israeli police against worshipers kneeling down and praying and celebrating their holiest days in one of their holiest places. No mention of al -Aqsa. being surrounded by violence, tear gas, smoke, while people pray. Can my colleagues imagine if it was their place of worship filled with tear gas? Could you pray as stun grenades were tossed into your holiest place? Above all, there has been absolutely no recognition of Palestinian humanity. If our own State Department can't even bring itself to acknowledge the killing of Palestinian children is wrong, well, I will say it for the millions of Americans who stand with me against the killing of innocent children, no matter their ethnicity or faith. I weep for all the lives lost under the unbearable status quo, every single one, no matter their faith, their background. We all deserve freedom, liberty, peace, and justice, and it should never be denied because of our faith or ethnic background. No child, Palestinian or Israeli, whoever they are, should ever have to worry that death will rain from the sky. How many of my colleagues are willing to say the same, to stand for Palestinian human rights as they do for Israelis? There is a crushing dehumanization to how we talk about this terrible violence. The New York Post reported that Palestinian death roll, reported the Palestinian death roll toll as Israeli casualties. ABC says that Israelis are, quote, killed, while Palestinians simply, quote, die, as if by magic, 
as if they were never human to begin with. Help me understand the math. How many Palestinians have to die for their lives to matter? Life under apartheid strips Palestinians of their human dignity. How would you feel if you had to go through dehumanizing checkpoints two blocks from your own home to go to the doctor or travel across your own land? How would you feel if you had to do it while pregnant in the scorching heat as soldiers with guns controlled your freedom? How would you feel it if you lived in Gaza where your power and water might be out for days or weeks at a time, where you cut, were cut off from your, the outside world by inhumane military blockade? Meanwhile, Palestinians' rights to nonviolent resistance have been curtailed and even criminalized. Our party leaders have spoken forcefully against BDS, calling its proponents anti-Semitic, despite the same tactics being critically critical to ending the South African apartheid mere decades ago. What we are telling Palestinians fighting apartheid is the same thing being told to my black neighbors and Americans throughout that are fighting against police brutality here. There is no form of acceptable resistance to state violence. As long as the message from Washington is that our military support for Israel is unconditional, Netanyahu's extremism, right-wing government will continue to expand settlements, continue to demolish homes, and continue to make the prospects for peace impossible. 330 of my own colleagues and Democrats and Republicans here, 75% of the body here, signed a letter pledging that Israel shall never be made, made to comply with basic human rights laws that other countries that receive our military aid must observe. You know, when I see the images and videos of destruction and death in Palestine, all I hear are the children screaming from pure fear and terror. I want to read something a mother named Iman in Gaza wrote two days ago. She said, quote, tonight I put the kids to sleep in our bedroom so that when we die, we die together. And no one would live to mourn the loss of another one. The statement broke me a little more because of my country's policies and funding will deny this mother's right to see children live, her own children live without fear and to grow old without painful trauma and violence. We must condition aid to Israel on compliance with international human rights and end the apartheid. We must, with no hesitation, demand that our country recognize the unconditional support of Israel has enabled the erasure of Palestinian life and the denial of the rights of millions of refugees and emboldens the apartheid policies that Human Rights Watch has detailed thoroughly in their recent report. I stand before you not only as a congresswoman for the beautiful 13 District Strong, but also as a proud daughter of Palestinian immigrants and the granddaughter of a loving Palestinian grandmother living in the occupied Philistine. You take that and you combine it with the fact that I was raised in one of the most beautiful, blackest cities in America, a city where movements for civil rights and social justice are birthed, the city of Detroit. So I can't stand here. I can't stand silent when injustice exists, where the truth is obscured. If there's one thing Detroit instilled in this Palestinian girl from Southwest, it's you always speak truth to power even if your voice shakes. The freedom of Palestinians is connected to the fight against oppression all over the world. Lastly, to my city in Palestine, Ashanik, on a whack of Hannah, I stand here because of you. Thank you. I yield back.